Welcome back. We're so happy to have you again. Um, thank you for joining us today for our third installation of the CSI series. Um, and my name is Ali Kane. I'm the curator of Woodwinds here at the SMM. And I'm Tom Strange, and I'm curator of the keyboards and now serving as executive director for Sigal Music Museum. Um, so before we get started, um, we'd once again like to thank the SD Humanities. The Metropolitan Arts Council and Alan Etheridge, thank you so much. Um, as well as the Elise Sigal Education Fund for the generous support that made this series, that is making this series possible um, throughout, especially throughout the pandemic. Um, so for those of you who joined us for the first lecture, welcome back. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, we're just going to recap what we're investigating throughout the CSI keyboards process. Um, so within the series, we've been giving you a closer look um, at the ins and outs of keyboard instruments, which were some of the most technically um, complex objects of their times. Um, and we're discussing how museums interact with these objects today. Um, so we'll explore how curators and conservators work together to best display, interpret, and care for these instruments and how they can better inform us of a musical path. Like any object, investigating and understanding these musical instruments begins with a CSI-like approach to read the object like a document and search for the evidence to understand materials, craftsmanship, ornament, and identity of the maker. These questions can be answered at various points in the investigative process, but sometimes they're never answered. But musical instruments were not made to sit silent. They are highly personal and dynamic objects. Closely investigating the evidence and contextualizing the history enables us to make the best decision as we can to safely interpret the instrument today. The instrument we'll be speaking about this afternoon is unfortunately not with us at the museum, um, but it's actually instead kept in our offsite storage unit and you will soon learn why. Um, also in today's lecture, we'll be once again joined by guest scholar John Watson, who will speak to the difficulties in interpreting and conserving, conserving an instrument um, which has seen better days, um, an issue that directly faces our Viennese pianoforte made by Johann Ehrlich around 1815. And I'm just going to introduce John now. Um, he's going to speak later, but um, we'll just uh, go through his, his biography briefly. Um, so John works as an independent conservator and maker of keyboard instruments. Um, in 2016, he retired from the Colony Williamsburg Foundation, where he served as the conservator and curator of musical instruments for 28 years. John's research has focused on the issues of musical instrument conservation, and he has published key books on the subject, including Artifacts in Use, The Paradox of Restoration, and the Conservation of Organs. His work reconstructing historic instruments provides a critical platform to better understand these musical instruments today. Recently, he has finished a reconstruction of the earliest American made piano and his reconstruction of the Washington family's 1793 harpsichord is currently on display at Mount Vernon. In the spring of 2020, John's long and influential career was celebrated with the American Musical Instrument Society's Kurt Sachs Award, the highest honor presented by the society for a lifetime contribution to the field of organology. Um, so for now though, we will turn our attention to the Johann Ehrlich piano and unpack what's going on both inside and out. Okay, so uh, Johann Ehrlich was born in 1782 in Yavor, a town controlled by Prussia at that time. Today, Yavor is located in Southwest Poland. Um, Ehrlich moved to Vienna by 1810, one of the many that flocked to the city during the population boom of the early 19th century. He applied for a business license as a piano maker and received those permissions by 1811. Next slide, please. Um, Vienna was a turbulent place during the first decade of the 19th century, occupied twice by Napoleon in 1805 and 1809, resulting in skirmishes and battles surrounding the city. After Napoleon's final loss, Vienna played a preeminent role in rebuilding diplomatic relationships across Europe, hosting the Congress of Vienna between 1814 and 1815. Next slide. Um, after the Congress, Empress, em Emperor uh, Francis II and Prime Minister Clemens von Metternich continued to rule and much of Vienna's middle-class socio-cultural cultural life experienced the same Biedermeier movement that we discussed last month with the Schleiplar Flugel of Berlin. 
Theaters and amusements flourished, such as the Prater, an elegant pleasure garden with a coffee house, panorama, and circus. However, the working classes suffered immensely with the burgeoning industrial revolution and the entire city struggled with effective infrastructure, notably a problematic sewer system and water supply. Unfortunately, the latter created devastating consequences down the road. Next slide. Um, Ehrlich's life was one of ordinary obscurity and marked by common tragedies of the 19th century. With his wife, Josepha, he had nine children between 1814 and 1832. The family moved around Vienna, living in at least four different addresses across the city. By the 1820s, they had found more permanent housing and settled it at 68 Lemgrub, a neighborhood once also home to Haydn, Beethoven, and other musicians and artists. Um, if you wanna just press the... Um, as with so many families, they experienced the loss of a child due to illness. Their two-year-old son, Carl, died of tuberculosis on Christmas 1830, 1822. Next slide. These are 20th century photographs near the Lem Group district with surviving early architecture that would have been similar to the type of houses that Ehrlich and his family lived in, juxtaposed with the later efforts of Emperor Franz Joseph to tear down the earlier housing during the middle of the 19th century. It was likely in buildings similar to this that Ehrlich, joined by his eldest son, August, who began to learn the trade, uh, made the piano that we have in the museum's collection. And it's the only one that survives with Ehrlich's name. Uh, next slide. Now the past year has enabled us to understand more of Ehrlich's experiences than ever before, as he and his family faced a cholera epidemic that ravaged Vienna between 1831 and 1832. Spread through the consumption of contaminated water, the bacteria caused severe dehydration and eventually death. And it wasn't just confined to Vienna, it was actually a pandemic spreading throughout Europe and North America. Next slide. Vienna actually had a more advanced sewer system than many European cities at the time. However, residents on the outskirts of the city would often dump waste into the brooks and streams that flowed into the Danube. In 1830, this contamination spread when a large blockage of ice caused the river to flood and overflow into the open sewer system seen on the image on the screen. Next slide. The city was suddenly gripped with the epidemic, spawning conflicting arguments about what caused the disease, how to treat it, how to avoid the miasmas that produced illness and blame the poor for being more susceptible. People did what they could to stay safe. And of course, some people were mocked like in this satirical print for going overboard in their preparations. Now this man, he's wearing a mask. Um, it may not have protected him from cholera, but it sure would have protected him now. <laughs> um, if you just wanna press the next, okay. Um, unfortunately, Johann and August Ehrlich, after avoiding the epidemic for over a year, perhaps took a sip of this contaminated water uh, while working on a piano in the summer of 1832. The proximity uh, from their home on the Lem Group to multiple water sources is visible on this map. Um, and Johann died of cholera on August 25th, and August died just three days later, leaving behind Josepha, who was pregnant, and six living children. Um, next slide. So ultimately, over 2,000 people in Vienna died of the disease, and the city took measures to cover the open water sources and improve the sewer system. But cholera cut off Ehrlich at what, have made, what may have been a promising career making pianos under his own name. Today, like I mentioned, this piano remind, remains as the only surviving testament to Ehrlich's life. Next slide. When he came to Vienna, Ehrlich was entering a highly competitive market of piano making in one of Europe's most musical cities. By the first decade of the 19th century, there were over 60 piano makers working in the city. Celebrated makers like Johann Andreas Stein, Andreas and Annette Stryker, and Anton Walter catered to the likes of Mozart, Beethoven, and later Schubert. It's likely that Ehrlich worked for another maker, producing ready-made instruments before trying to produce his instruments under his own name and perhaps afterwards. Next slide. Uh, Viennese instruments had emerged as a force in piano making across Austria and Germany in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, particularly revolutionized by the efforts of maker Johann Andreas Stein and later Anton Walter. Featuring a new type of action that differed from the English, people throughout the region grew to pr prefer the Viennese sound. With the endorsements of composers like Mozart, Haydn, and Beethoven, the market for Viennese pianos grew rapidly resulting in an abundance of makers in the city, like Johann Ehrlich, who joined in the attempt to make a name for himself. 
Next slide. Ehrlich's efforts mirror the fine craftsmanship and ornament found on other instruments and pieces of furniture in Vienna. While crafted of fine materials, much of the instrument's decorative prowess comes from the imagery on the curved nameboard and lid. These images are highly detailed and extraordinarily clear, and they almost look printed on, and that's because they are. Next slide. Um, this is a technique called transfer printing, which allowed an engraved or etched image to be applied to a variety of objects. The use of transfer printing is overwhelmingly most common in ceramics, uh, which have been practicing the technique since the mid 18th century. Transfer printing sometimes also appears on glass. Um, next slide. By the early 19th century, prints were occasionally put onto furniture. Like ceramics, the image would be applied to a paper, prepared, adhered to a prepared wooden surface, and then the paper would be removed. The print would then be protected by an additional coating of varnish or shellac. Next slide. Uh, when, Ehrlich, uh, when comparing the Ehrlich name board to another Viennese name board in the sickle collection that is also quite ornate with a beautiful design, we can see the evidence of transfer printing versus a freehand design by looking at the engraved points and lines on the Ehrlich contrasted by the delicate tones of shading and brush marks on the other instrument. Next slide. The ornament throughout the instrument embodies broad trends in fashion and design. Uh, much of the transfer printing on the name board highlights a pastoral rusticated type landscape with figures resting on the banks of a river or working around the farmhouse. As a transfer printing, um, there may be particular design sources for these images and they may appear on other objects as well, um, but further research needs to be done to follow up on these possibilities. Next slide. Uh, the maker's label features a contrasting aesthetic, this one accent, accenting an intimate salon gathering. The image focuses on the women in the center, relaxing on a chaise lounge while perhaps enjoying a coffee, while the man on the left flirtatiously hands her a handkerchief. The women in the back gasp at the scandalous scene. Um, now these figures are all clad in turbans and robes in the popular a la Turk style, if you want to just press the next. Um, which is an embodiment of a European obsession with the Ottoman Empire, which spilled over into fashion, art, and music. Just give Mozart's um, opera, The Abduction of the Seraglio, or his Sonata a la Turk, a listen. Um, however, this fascination was rooted in colonialism and exoticism um, and exhibited in westernized appropriations of Turkish culture. Uh, next slide. Um, adorned with figurines, the legs of the early piano exhibit another trend in 19th century decorative arts, similar to the Viennese piano shown on the screen. I do want to note that some of the following slides contain, contain images that can be considered offensive. Um, next slide. The use of these figures on the legs, known as blackamoors, represent a white European notion of a black or dark-skinned person with Moorish ancestry, people typically in a position of enslavement or servitude, most often utilized in objects of fine craftsmanship, they express exoticism, wealth, and control, turning the black body into something that one can purchase for decoration. Their presence in the decorative arts deepens the commoditization of black bodies outside of enslavement. Next slide. No matter what type of object they're part of, these figurines are often positioned in an action of subjugation. In the context of the Ehrlich and other similar examples, they are literally holding up a piano, the crux of Western art music, further dehumanizing their humanity and reinforcing the narrative that they inherently exist in a position of servitude to privileged white Europeans. Next slide. Um, this type of imagery is well known in American decorative arts, particularly in the second half of the 19th and early 20th centuries. But it's important to recognize the widespread and pervasive commoditization of the black body across both North America and Europe, especially when looking at an item that has so much beauty in craftsmanship and design. It's critical that we don't overlook the simultaneous ugliness of these pieces. Um, but you know, what can we learn now from the inside? We're going to turn to Tom to explore the evidence from within. Thank you, Allie. So what we have in front of us uh, is a six octave uh, grand piano uh, in a somewhat derelict condition. Uh, this one uh, had been the, the property of John Coster. Uh, and uh, when we were acquiring the Sigel Music Museum, uh, John was kind enough to offer this uh, to the museum as well. Uh, we were happy to take it. Uh, these instruments with the, uh, the curved uh, rest plank front are less frequently encountered 
And uh, it, it's something that we didn't have any sort of an example of uh, in the, the museum's collection. So happy to take it. Uh, and uh, later we're gonna talk a little bit more about uh, that whole intake process uh, decision-making that goes on. Next slide. So uh, right now the, the instrument is on sawhorses uh, and you can see that uh, you know, the, the case is in fairly rough shape. Uh, it's seen a deal of water, the soundboard uh, badly split and rippled uh, and you know, the entire thing you know, just, you know, presenting uh, an instrument that uh, hasn't seen any care or, or, or attention really uh, for probably 100 years. Uh, next slide. The name board, our name plaque, uh, is actually on the outside of the case, the fallboard flap that would normally close the keys over. Uh, a fairly unusual place to put a name. Normally, we find it inside the, the piano. But uh, of course, in this case, with the lid open and, uh, and closed flat, uh, the plaque would be left uh, standing up uh, as the kind of the last thing you saw. So uh, you know, the, the, the maker's name is gonna be there for everybody to see uh, a, a, a brass uh, a ring that uh, you know, covers the plaque. And then uh, I am told that the story uh, between the, the, the gentleman and the lady uh, involves a certain amount of Excuse me. A certain amount of, uh, of, of a scandal that was popular at the time. All right, next slide, please. So here's the instrument uh, from a frontal view. Uh, we've, we're missing a few ivories, but they have been uh, saved. Most of the instrument is actually here, uh, and we're going to go into it with a little more depth. Next slide. So the first thing we notice is uh, the uh, bridge is a continuous bridge from bass to treble, no split bridge here. Uh, this is very common in Viennese grand pianos from this period. And in fact, uh, would move in well into the uh, 1830s. Uh, the, the idea of splitting the bridge had been something that had been developed uh, certainly among uh, London made pianos uh, from as early as 1790, the 1790s, early 1790s. Uh, Broadwood, uh, after about 1790, uh, didn't make any more uh, pianos without the split bridge. Uh, Johann Schanz, uh, working in Vienna, uh, made them with both split bridge in the bass and also continuous bridge like this uh, throughout his life until 1827. Uh, one thing that uh, is a little different is that the string lengths are all equal. So it's tricord throughout, three strings per note and each string the same length uh, for that particular string. Next slide, please. And here you can see the, uh, the under uh, cut uh, on the bridge for the wires. Uh, and then you see how the, the pins are all lined up to give that equal length to the string. Next slide. The uh, end of the bridge where the base is has been cut away, which is a very common thing for the Viennese pianos. Uh, very uncommon to see any London piano with such a feature. Uh, but uh, this is the way almost all the Viennese pianos did. The, the cutting away of the bridge uh, relieves a little mass and allows the, uh, the soundboard to resonate a little bit better in that area. Next slide. Uh, here are the, some signs of the hitch pins. And you know, uh, on the right-hand side, we see uh, in the treble, uh, a crack in the hitch pin rail, quite common. Uh, the the, the uh, wood had to be uh, pieced together uh, to make the uh, strong curve here. And what we have here is not so much a crack as a, an opening of a seam between uh, two pieces. Uh, the, the hitch pins are largely correct, uh, but we have reason to believe that this wire has been changed and probably changed uh, you know, somewhere in the 19th century. If we go to the next picture, we can see why. So here are the tuning pins and each of the tuning pins has been drilled. This was not the habit and, and practice of the Viennese makers at the time. Uh, drill tuning pins don't actually begin to appear until the 1820s. Uh, and we suspect probably started in America and then, uh, then moved out. Um, but uh, here we have the drill tuning pins. So what I know from this is that uh, these pins have been extracted, they've been drilled and then new wire put on at some point in the past. Next picture. Here's the tail of the piano showing the veneer. The veneer looks fairly rough. It actually is not in as bad a 
uh, condition as it appears, but it's uh, a nice walnut uh, veneer, uh, fairly heavily figured. And so if it's decided to bring this piano you know, back into at least display mode, uh, there are some things that we can do to consolidate uh, the, the rough areas, bringing the look all together and still not lose effectively any original finish if we want to. I would note that uh, after we make the, the curve there, you see the little uh, curved tail part, the spine and the end of the tail have separated at this point, but it's a fairly easy lap joint and something that uh, if you want to repair it, uh, that would go back together uh, fairly straightforward. Next slide. This is that uh, uh, picture of the main board and, and or the, the, the curved rest plank front. Um, and it's just a very elegant and nice look to it. And uh, one of the nicest preserved uh, parts of the piano. So uh, you know, we're lucky uh, that the piano has been able to arrive with this in relatively intact shape. It's a nice pastoral scene, a uh, very common uh, sort of uh, look for these sort of pianos. Um, and uh, just wanted to, to bring it forward. Uh, notice that on the, the, uh, the keyboard, the, the uh, ivories uh, or bone uh, have been uh, you know, separate heads and tails. This is very common. There's a lot of cracking uh, in the key coverings for the naturals uh, as the key uh, saw moisture and expanded and then contracted. Uh, I know this piano has seen a great deal of uh, moisture excursions uh, during its life. You can tell that from the veneer on the outside and also from what's happened here on, on the, the uh, keyboard itself. Next picture. Underneath, uh, we have the usual uh, 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 trap work for the stops. Uh, this one appears to have uh, four or maybe five pedals uh, and we will have to work it out when when we are able to turn the piano on its side and spend a little more time just looking at this. Uh, but I will note that uh, while most of them are there, one of them is missing. And the one that's missing actually uh, is a uh, trap work that, that goes near the middle of the piano. And then if we go to the next slide, uh, looking through, the, through a crack in the soundboard, haha, we can look inside and see that rough roundish looking piece there is uh, the head of a drum beater. And so the way this one worked was when you pushed on that pedal, uh, it made the drum uh, beater uh, fly up and hit the bottom of the soundboard and made a, a tremendous boom uh, when it did that. And this was for the Janissary or Turkish music. Uh, I expected to see this there. And so when I went looking for it, there it was. Uh, it's, it's neat to see. And I suspect that, uh, that everything that we need from the inside portion is still working. Normally, these were leather covered, uh, stuffed with uh, horse hair and uh, stuffed as tight as you can possibly stuff them and then gathered fiercely and uh, around a, a little wood dowel that would then be uh, screwed to this uh, lever. Okay, next picture. The lid on this piano is unusually thick. It's a very heavy duty lid, a very heavy uh, piece of the piano. Uh, and so the lid has survived uh, pretty well. Uh, it's a little bit rough on the top, not too bad. The bottom is nearly pristine and the whole lid, uh, you know, without any battens uh, is still relatively flat and intact. Next picture. Uh, the little piece on the right, uh, the little acorn finial, uh, there's two of these on either side. Uh, they're for uh, essentially uh, decoration. They assist in drawing the action, but uh, as anyone who knows Viennese pianos will tell you, we never grab the, the, the brass finial to actually extract uh, an action from the piano. We're usually holding on only to the wood. And then uh, Ali has pointed out the legs are, are these uh, carry uh, uh, fairly nicely carved, but I would call it inexpensively carved. The arms don't flail out very far. And what we've, we've done is made sure that for every, whatever chunk of wood they had to make the carving, everything fit within that chunk of wood. Next, next picture. And we've seen some other things on this piano that, that indicate that there was a little cost co conservation going on. 
uh, on the left hand side, uh, that little brass post uh, that looks like maybe the top has been knocked off of it, uh, almost certainly has been. Uh, that was for one end of the bassoon stop. The other end fitted into the wood there on the uh, left cheek side. And if I go to the next picture, you can see one that's still intact. This is a much better preserved piano. Note that at the back of the piano, this has the divided bridge. Uh, the red arrow is showing you where that bassoon stop uh, is, is normally located. And ours is located in a very similar position. Next picture. So uh, we have a couple or have three gap spacers on this piano. Most of the Viennese grands from this period use the same kind of gap spacers uh, and they go in and they support the, the gap between the belly rail and the, the rest plank so that as the uh, ever increasing tension on this, these pianos uh, is brought to bear, uh, this helps the piano keep from, from actually collapsing. Uh, on, on this one, as with most pianos uh, that are 200 years old and saw, saw tension most of their life, uh, there's been some compression of the wood. You can see where it's kind of uh, bumped up, buckled up a little bit. Uh, this one is not bad at all. Uh, and so if we wanted this piano to hold tension again, I have every reason to believe that it would be able to do so just you know, based on the condition from where we are now. Next picture. Uh, here's on the left side, uh, inside of the, the, the piano, uh, and it's up near the rest plank, which you see over there on the far left. There's a hole there. That hole had a dowel that came up uh, through it. The dowel activated a little arm, and then you see some screw holes there, which are witness marks to where there were once a set of bells. So not only did we beat the drum, but we rang the bell uh, each time we, uh, we struck the pedal. And we'll have to look, this one may have had an independent pedal for ringing the bells independently of striking the, the drum. Uh, I, I haven't worked that part out uh, uh, yet because we're, right now we're still just uh, figuring out exactly what we've got. So next picture. Uh, and then here's at the edge of the, the soundboard. Um, and so what you're seeing is uh, a fletch uh, near the bottom and then that center uh, arrow shows you the division where a new fletch of wood started. And then up in the back, you'll see some places where soundboard wood have been, has been pieced in. It's been pieced in because that particular fletch of soundboard was cut from uh, another application and he's conserving wood at all costs and soundboard wood was, was fairly expensive. Uh, and so what he's done is made use of some wood that would almost but not quite work and fitted in some additional soundboard uh, material. To the uh, uneducated eye, as you just look at the piano, you won't even see it. Next picture. So you notice that there were some things that were missing and many of those things that were missing are still with the piano, such as the lid prop, uh, the, the little front of the piano that covers where the action slides out. Um, and then there's a, a left cheek corner that, uh, that was broken off at some point. And then some random veneer pieces. And also the, the damper rail, uh, uh, damper rack holder. Uh, all the dampers are gone. There are no dampers uh, left at all in this piano. Uh, but we do have the lower guide and most of the upper guide, uh, which is extremely helpful and refitting uh, a new set of uh, dampers if you want to. Next slide. Uh, the action is extremely rough. Uh, it looks as though the kids uh, got into it and decided to just bang on things until they broke. Uh, they also, uh, there's, there's some places where the, the pads that lift the dampers have been smashed down. But in general, everything that we need to know is there uh, and new pieces can, can be fairly uh, easily made uh, to replace anything that is missing. Next picture. And then we have uh, you know, bags and boxes of some of the loose pieces so that uh, should we want to, there's more than enough material to uh, take and bring us back to something that uh, would work very, very well indeed. Next picture. Uh, there was a moderator 
the moderator that is in the panel now uh, has been very amateurishly built. Uh, there is another moderator, uh, Batten, uh, that came with the panel that uh, might have been part of the original. I'm going to check with John, John Coster, to see if he knows uh, anything about that. But it wouldn't be a great stretch to put together a, uh, a new Batten uh, that has the Batten uh, extension tabs, you know, cut to the right length and all in the right place. Uh, so that the, the uh, moderator button could function on this panel again. The next picture. And with that, I'm going to stop. Uh, and then we're going to turn it over to John Watson, who we introduced earlier. John? So thank you. Uh, for the next few minutes, we're going to talk about the decision making we do in the museum. And there's lots of that to do. First, the curators have to think about whether to take an object into the collection in the first place. Then once it's there, and considering a collection of mostly very old objects, that uh, uh, the question is, what should we do for the objects that are in some state of decay? And trust me, almost always, they're calling out for at least some sort of conservation. And then once the object is ready to be put to some use, how can we use the object to benefit humankind? whether through themed exhibits or public concerts or publications or a study objects for research. My assignment today is to offer a decision protocol for each of those first two sets of decisions, starting with number one. When there's an opportunity to add an instrument into the collection, how do we decide if it's a worthy and appropriate addition? We have a very current example to illustrate this first decision protocol. Uh, this was offered as a donation to the Sigel Music Museum just this last Monday. I was privileged to be the link between the donor and the museum. So the question is, how do we decide? Is the gift really um, appropriate for the collection? And it's not a simple decision, not as simple as you might think because with ownership comes some burdens, some obligations for giving this thing a safe place uh, and keyboard instruments take a lot of space. And also the ongoing preventive conservation is no small matter. It's expensive and it goes on essentially for the life of the object. So it's a heavy burden to, uh, to agree to accept something into the collection and so let's have a look at that decision protocol. We're going to measure the uh, instrument then according to four types of value. You know, the question is, is this valuable? Is it valuable for our collection? And the first kind of value we'll look at is the associative value. And that has to do with the mostly the people that might have been associated with this or, you know, does it have a, uh, a famous former owner or maker. Uh, and in this case, we can check both of those boxes. The maker is uh, Ignaz Kober um, of Vienna. And uh, he was the organ maker to the emperor uh, as of the year 1800, about the time this instrument was made. So he was uh, a celebrity in his own time. He was part of the lineage of celebrated masters of Viennese piano making, including uh, Christoph Kluckner, uh, Johann Andreas Stein, Katholnik, uh, Ferdinand Hoffmann, and so forth. So he's an important character. He was also the maker of the earliest surviving Viennese square piano uh, from 1788. Also past owners of this instrument are said to include uh, Kaiser Franz Josef, the uh, owner before last, claimed to have taken it from the residence of uh, Franz Josef uh, in the uh, 1940s, I think. So we have association with very important people. There's also, of course, and perhaps more importantly for the Sigel Music Museum, an association with the uh, Mozart era of Vienna. So this is an association of a culture, and it's a very important instrument, actually very similar to, uh, to the uh, 
the instruments that we featured in both this episode and the previous episode of, of this uh, series. The next uh, type of value is informational value. And here again, we have uh, a good, uh, we have a good score because Kober is often mentioned in histories, uh, published histories of the piano because he was known for this type of action, which I've drawn in the bottom of the screen uh, to people familiar with Viennese pianos. It might look uh, like a almost a cross between a, an English style action and a Viennese style action. Uh, and it turns out that Kober is an excellent um, um, illustration of the fact that the early um, Viennese action was actually started out as a, a, uh, an, a basically a type of action that was associated with the English, the Stoss mechanic. Um, so Kober is uh, a useful example for illustrating a particular moment, a significant moment in the uh, historical development of the piano. The next type of value an instrument might have is the aesthetic uh, value. And that has uh, two levels. It could be uh, how good it sounds or how good it looks. And this instrument has certainly scores well in the, uh, the appearance. It's a very high style uh, piece of, um, of craftsmanship, very elegant inlays on the name board in both brass and silver, uh, ormolu decoration and so forth. So it displays very well. As for how good it sounds, uh, let's just table that until, um, until we get to the conservation questions. And the fourth type of value it might have for the collection is economic or utilitarian value. And that again is simply, how good does it play? How much are we gonna be able to use this for playing Mozart in, uh, in the museum? And even if it didn't play, it might have some economic value because of its, um, because of its attractive appearance, um, that it, it's, uh, it's a draw for visitors to the museum like the other uh, very uh, beautiful instruments in the museum. So it has some economic value. The important thing about this, this uh, decision protocol is that any one of those types of value might be enough for an object to be brought into the museum. Uh, for the concept that a piano needs to play in order to be worthy of a collection, uh, simply it is blind to all of those other types of value that might be just as important or more important in a particular example. So now that the instrument um, scores well, I would say just by those first uh, two types of value, associative and informational, uh, it's a slam dunk. And uh, so Tom said, yes, indeed, this is worthy of the collection and it's headed to the, uh, the Sigel Music Museum. So now that it's in the collection, uh, it doesn't play, should we restore it? And if so, how? So here we're going to talk about the restoration decision protocol. And uh, this is a set of um, 15 questions that a conservator asks him or herself, not only for an overall object that's about to be restored, but every step of restoration. I actually, uh, in, in my uh, years in the conservation laboratory, kept this list uh, posted on the wall and frequently went through every question all 15, actually 17 questions, when I was about to do the next step, because every step of the restoration should uh, take into to account each of those, those questions. So let's go through them. The first, have we done our homework? Um, before we make pronouncements of, oh, this piano was that way, not the way it is now, so I'll change it. That requires that we have done our homework, which is really in two major ways. One is what is the published literature on that type of piano, that maker, uh, other 
similar examples, but it's also the uh, the object file in a museum almost uh, always there's a very important object folder that has all kinds of um, papers pertaining to the particular object um, that includes very importantly the insights of uh, previous um, scholars who have examined it and um, typically includes photographs sometimes photographs from before uh, some changes were made and it's a chance to look at an earlier state in any case that question have we done our homework before we decide what to do on this next step which of those four object values are important number two the four things that we first talked about in deciding uh, to uh, to accession the object into the collection now comes up again as we decide on a treatment um, we have seen that this instrument is, uh, or we'll see uh, more, more fully, that the, the fourth one there, economic utilitarian value, is uh, rather unimportant. That it plays music is not as important as its, its terrifically important associative value, its very important informational and documentary value. So as we approach uh, this next step, whatever the step is, on the restoration or the preparation, conservation, stabilization, whatever it is we we're about to lay hands on the instrument to do, we uh, we're respectful of what its special value is. This is the underside of the piano, and here we see the Achilles heel of this piano. This is the reason why this instrument is not going to be restorable, but we'll talk about that. Uh, later. For now, uh, question number three in our uh, protocol is, when is it better to change our expectations rather than change the instrument itself? Uh, so if we come uh, approach this instrument and think, should we restore it? And we see some things about the, the past work that's been done. Again, we'll explain more in a minute. Uh, if we discover that no, it is not restorable, then there, the, the, the thing that we can do about that is not restore, but change our expectations and, and start thinking of this not as a broken piano, but a magnificent document of early Viennese piano making. Number four, how minimal can the treatment be for acceptable results? I should mention that this instrument will have some conservation work done uh, just for its exhibit uh, qualities. And you can see here some stray white paint that got smeared on the instrument, probably when someone was painting the room it was in. Um, and so item four, how minimal can the treatment be for acceptable results? Uh, so I'm gonna have to clean off that white paint. Um, how minimal can it be? I could refinish the whole piano, that'll take care of it. But it would also eliminate lots of other historical evidence in the, in the coatings. Uh, so uh, this ties into number five. Um, will the treatment cause collateral damage to the surrounding areas? Is there a more targeted approach? And in this case, yes, indeed, a conservator would, uh, would uh, analyze the nature of both the white layer and the layers underneath uh, and determine methods uh, for taking off just the white and leaving the, uh, the historic layers beneath it untouched, a targeted approach. Number six, how will the treatment affect future conservation options? If the person who restored this piano back in the, probably about the 1930s, if he had asked himself this question, he might not have done what he did. Uh, he glued a bottom, a plywood bottom to the instrument uh, for, um, for a number of reasons, and he used non-soluble glue. So now we don't have the option of taking that bottom off uh, because it would do terrific damage if we, if we tried. And, uh, and as you could also see, by the way, in this picture that there's a lot of insect damage, powder post beetle damage. So any attempt to take off that uh, that bottom would, would do great damage. So everything we do, we ask ourselves, 
are are um, are we limiting future options for treatment by doing it this way? And number seven, what evidence will be lost, covered up, or altered? And in this case, um, we're actually going to touch on this uh, in a minute, but um, but we would love to see what's on the other side of that plywood. And uh, and again, because we can't take it off, we can't. So uh, so part of the historical uh, record that this piano is, the historical evidence, is now put out of reach. Number eight, how rare is the threatened evidence? Again, here's the bottom of the instrument. That big piece of plywood keeps us from seeing uh, what's, uh, what's hidden. And uh, that would tell us some things about the musical resources that the piano first uh, had. And um, and we're unable to see it because of the plywood. So again, we ask ourselves when we're about to do uh, a treatment, is, um, is the uh, evidence that we're going to be affecting, hope, hopefully we find a way not to affect it at all, but, but that's only uh, an ambition, that's only an aspiration, but w there is gonna be some effect and, uh, and what, uh, how rare is that? Maybe we should just leave it alone because it's so important. It's better to substitute. <laughs> excuse me. It's better to substitute a reproduction part, and uh, and archive the original part. Is it better? This is actually the same question we our last episode was about. Sometimes an entire instrument. Uh, it's better to make a reproduction than to uh, than to um, to re restore the original. And that's true on an individual parts. Actually, the, the Schleip Lyraflugel that we talked about last time, uh, just the front we were considering, possibly just making the front uh, and in order not to impact the original parts. So that's a question. And number 10, is it possible to archive at least samples of removed material? In the picture are some pieces of a 1790s um, piano that I, um, I, I did the treatment on a, a couple of years ago. And all the pieces that I had to replace, I was able to save uh, the original material and uh, clearly labeled it. And um, it's put in an acid-free box. It goes to the museum and is cataloged into the collection. The location of the box is, um, is put in the uh, collection database and it's tracked just like any other object. It's still a very important part of the artifact. Number 11, can and will the intervention be fully documented? I try to document things in two ways, uh, but sometimes it's hard. In this case, these hammers uh, got new leather and I was able to, there was plenty of room uh, right on the hinges that get covered up by the, uh, by the cap rail, all hammer leather 2019. So I was able to actually uh, document it right on the object. And of course, also the report, uh, the treatment report uh, outlines everything that was done. I like to uh, do it both ways and assume that the report, the paper report could get lost in the future. So it's best to uh, try to document both ways. Number 12, if a treatment alternative is subtractive, is there a reasonable alternative? Okay, so I'm faced with these keys that are warped. We're looking at the back end of the key and the keys are warped every which way and some of them are touching each other. Very often, uh, restorers are tempted to take out a plane and plane off where they're rubbing. It solves the problem, but it's a subtractive treatment. It not only removes um, surface evidence that might be on the key, but it also um, changes the balance of the key. It's a very destructive approach. Um, the alternative that's that's not um, that's less invasive is to bend the key with heat. And here you could see the key lever uh, here clamped to this wooden framework that I have. And uh, this is a heat gun. And I'm able to, with the clamp, apply a little bit of bend in the corrective direction and just move it back and forth. Uh, bend the key with uh, with no loss of any evidence, and uh, it responds very well in just a minute or so. So, uh, is my treatment 
um, minimally invasive, uh, not subtractive. Number 13, where material must be removed, is it possible to leave at least a fragment of the material in place to preserve details of original material and workmanship? This is a photograph of a treatment I did a few years ago of a, a piano um, action removed from the instrument. This was a combination uh, upright grand piano and organ. And you could see that the leather on the ends of the key levers, the key levers are original in this instrument, the, the, the action had to be reproduced. But the uh, key levers were original and the leather uh, all had, it was very degraded and we had to replace it. But you could see way down near the end of the compass, two of the least used keys, we were able to leave just the original leather. Um, and that is a physical full documentation, really. In the future, someone can see exactly what the original leather was. I didn't, uh, I could have in the name of thoroughness replaced that, but, um, but it's a wonderful, um, very effective method of treatment to actually leave something like that alone. It's not seen. So, uh, so that is uh, the, uh, uh, the thing that comes to mind when we look at uh, question 13. Number 14, are the specialized expertise and skills available to undertake the treatment? This is a pretty extreme example in the picture. These are some hammers uh, from a 1790s square piano and you could see the two on the right were very crudely replaced by someone. Um, and uh, although this is a, a pretty extreme case, uh, there certainly are many, many examples when we're tempted to compromise in various ways um, about uh, achieving the, the kind of work, workmanship uh, results that the original maker would, uh, would, would agree to. So there's an obligation uh, to the uh, desires of the original maker. Uh, and number 15, is the treatment removable or reversible? That again, this bottom is, uh, is an example of that. I uh, suspect that I have run out of time, but uh, these decision protocols are detailed in um, this book, Artifacts in Use, um, little uh, uh, shameless promotion here. Uh, that's my book. But the other book, Rational Decision-Making and the Preservation of Cultural Property, goes into great detail in the complexities of the decision-making that has to be done in museums. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Tom. Thank you, John. And uh, hopefully you found uh, you know, this little uh, treatise uh, interesting today. You know, we've been, uh, been spending a little time you know, talking about you know, several of these very early, uh, almost unique uh, instruments. And then you know, part of the responsibility that a museum has and what do you do with it when you want to do something more with it. And uh, I think that John has, has done a great job of, of walking us through that. I will tell you that uh, I have uh, an interest in seeing the Ehrlich uh, brought back to playing condition. Uh, but as with all of these things, uh, it's kind of going to be a kind of a group decision. And that decision has not been made yet. So we're going to be uh, spending a little time, uh, Ali, John, and myself, and a few other decision, uh, you know, wise men uh, as we look at it and see what we, we think would be best for the museum. In the meantime, question and answer. Yeah, we're going to um, wrap up today with another question and answer session. Um, so if you have any questions, now would be a good time um, to put them in the, the Zoom question box. Or if you're watching from Facebook, you can just comment on the video as well. So I was going to ask you, John, um, with all these wonderful steps that you were going through, so they're so thorough. How many times did you get through you know, halfway and then, and then realize that you weren't going to keep going? Um, is that something that happened often, or can you talk about an experience where you where you did hit sort of maybe number six or something, and then decided to to stop? Sure. Uh, yeah. Not all of those steps are pertinent to every step of a, a conservation point, and actually, uh, all of it should be second nature to someone who's uh, who's in the business, who's a conservator. So uh, yeah, sure. There were many times when I didn't have to consult the list. The list. It came in most handy for me when I was not sure, when I was scratching my head and 
on the fence. And it helped uh, to organize my thinking and uh, take all the things into account that need to be uh, thought about. All right, great. Um, and actually regarding your books, we do have a question um, from Carmen Sanford. Where can, where can one find your books? Where do we get them? Um, the Artifacts in Use book, uh, easiest thing is uh, go to, to Amazon and search John Watson, Artifacts in Use. All right, all right. And it will come up. <laughs> Um, we have a uh, Jacob Mormon is asking, how would you go about the repairs on the soundboard um, of the Ehrlich, I assume? Yeah, uh, well, let, let me say what uh, I have done in the past with that. So, you know, the, the soundboard is not a disposable object. That's, uh, you know, it, it's effectively, you know, the, the heart of the instrument as it gets. Uh, in the 20th century, uh, the, it was typical to just take that out and put a new soundboard in thinking, well, uh, nothing much has changed. Uh, I completely disagree and that's not what we do. The soundboard can be soaked out of this instrument without too much uh, you know, trouble because uh, there's not a lot that has to be removed to get to it. Once it's out, you know, my approach has, has typically been to wet the entire thing, carefully remove the bridge and the ribs, document where everything was uh, you know, get the instrument uh, uh, or get the soundboard soaked uh, in a special tray that we would make large enough to, to handle it. And uh, typically it'll go flat and, and uh, can be dried flat and then put back together uh, when you do that. And uh, if you put it back together and then uh, you know, take a little pains with how you uh, make sure you ensure the joints are, are, are sealed on the bottom, uh, then we can have a soundboard that uh, might not come apart again. I was also thinking um, in our collection, we have a, a famous infamous square piano that um, was actually part of a chicken coop at one point and Tom here brought it back to life. So I thought um, either you or John could, could talk about an instrument that was just really far gone that you that you managed to bring back um, to, to a sort of living situation where you were able to play it again. Like what was the worst one that you've ever seen? Well, for, for me, I'll just say that was the worst. <laughs> that was the worst one I'd ever seen. Uh, it still had the elements of the chicken coop about it, and it needed to be cleaned off. It was a 1791 uh, Longman and Broderick square piano. Uh, there are many, many examples of Longman and Broderick, and even from the early 1790s and even from 1791 that are in the database that were in very good condition. So. It's a piano that we know a lot about, and it's a piano that uh, in and of itself, uh, it was so derelict, uh, it was like, well, what else would you do with it? Uh, John has an expression called uh, having crossed the line. Well, this one not only crossed the line, but it, it had gotten actually into the grave and it was ready to be it covered up. It looped back around to the beginning of the line. <laughs> so although I, I, I did the, the 15 questions and I was proud that I saved everything that came to me, went back on that piano, uh, and we didn't have to make too much new stuff. Uh, it, it also was a, an instrument where bringing it back to life uh, you know, was, was certainly better than you know, pushing it in a corner and never seeing it again because it was just beyond displayable at that point. John? Yeah, what about you, John? Yeah, um, I, actually the, uh, the uh, organ piano combination instrument was in that category. The uh, organ pipes had been uh, smashed and mashed and they came out in uh, small cardboard boxes and uh, the piano action had been lost entirely and the object was in um, dozens and dozens of pieces. But, uh, but uh, it took um, two years of work and a staff of several people um, and we had the motivation for all kinds of reasons to uh, do the work and we were able to uh, put it back in, uh, in uh, playing condition. The, uh, the report on that, I can't remember how many pages it is, but it, it's over hundred pages long, just the, the, the report on, on what we did, not to mention hundreds and hundreds of photographs, videos and so forth. Uh, but yeah, that's, we've, um, We've uh, had some great opportunities, haven't we, Tom? Yeah. And that was an extraordinary effort that, that everybody was, you know, just absolutely amazed about. 
And it was a, a rare opportunity, as you've explained it, you know, where you had the right team at the right time, at the right place, you know, for that instrument to come into the collection and go through that, uh, you know, shift it by five years either way, and it probably wouldn't have been possible. True. And, uh, you know, many, many of us have seen instruments where, you know, we look at it and say, you know, quite honestly, this is probably beyond my skill. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know who I would turn to, nor would we be able to afford it. And actually, this segues really well with a question from Carmen Stanford, who, who asks about um, the possibility of passing an instrument on to a different institution in order for it to get the treatment that it might need um, and has better facilities to restore and um, you know, preserve the instrument. Um, you can speak to that about Cloning Williamsburg. Potentially, John. I'll, I'll just make a, a quick comment. Uh, I was acquiring an instrument and wound up with an organized square piano at the same time. And I immediately said, this needs to go to Colonial Williamsburg. They're working on this other instrument that, that's you know, unique uh, of its type. And to have the two types of organized pianos uh, would, would be huge, particularly since it's from the right period and uh, it would display very well. And John graciously uh, was uh, able to talk uh, Williamsburg into taking that in. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think you know, that, that was one where I, I didn't even have to think twice. <laughs> this one needs to go somewhere else. That was a, yeah, that was a great uh, success story. Uh, and I think uh, museums are all on the same team. Uh, we're in the business of uh, trying to educate the public and to preserve this heritage of, um, of historical objects. And if your museum uh, can do a better job than mine uh, with this object, um, I'll give it to you or, or we'll swap it so that the things end up in the most uh, appropriate place. But yeah, that, uh, that organized square piano was a fantastic um, addition and gave great meaning to the uh, upright grand piano that we already had. So thank you again for that, Tom. It worked. <laughs> yeah, we're lucky we're in such a, a congenial field. We, we're always looking out for one another, which is super nice. Um, and then uh, the final question that, that we had, um, is a technological question again, um, from Andrew Willis. Um, he's asking, what is dangerous about pulling on the finials when drawing the axes? Uh, well, I'll answer that real quickly. Uh, they can break off, and uh, and if they do, then you know repairing that uh, is a little unsightly. It'll never be quite the same again, and uh, and you don't have to actually grab those to do your business. So uh, Paul Paletti, uh, you know, was, was very uh, virulent about this when he was uh, you know coaching me on uh, Viennese pianos. But I I uh, take great pains not to grab the finials when I'm pulling the action out. John, what would you like to say? Uh, I agree completely. Um, one, of the, one of the first things that uh, you know, staff members get training in, in, uh, in the museum that I worked in uh, at Colonial Williamsburg was how to handle each type of object. And um, when, you're, when you're picking up a teacup, uh, most people, pick it up by what? The handle, that's what the handle's for. But in a museum, you have to assume that handle might've been glued on or it may be ready to fall off. So we always go that little kind of extra step to handle objects in a way that, um, that ensures that they won't suffer damage. Yes, sir. All right. Well, um, I think that's going to be it for our questions today, um, but we are going to repost this video. Um, it'll be on YouTube and it will be um, permanently on Facebook. So if you have other questions, you can ask them underneath and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. Um, but stay tuned for the final um, uh, iteration of CSI Keyboards. Um, it's going to be happening in a, just about three weeks um, at the end of February. So stay tuned for that. Um, and thank you again for joining us today. We will and see you next time. Just a, a quick preview for the, for the last one. We're going to be looking at a piano by John Isaac Hawkins. Uh, uh, another one of these where there are very few examples. And this is probably one of the most important 
uh, builders because he's brought forward effectively the, uh, the first upright piano uh, and began his building in America. And uh, we have two of the three pianos that he made. Uh, uh, one of them uh, is, is you know, magnificent. It can be seen in engravings and etchings from the 19th century uh, when it was being used as an example. So uh, here's a piano that you really do ask three times uh, before you, you even uh, open the, the keyboard cover, <laughs> what are you going to do with it? It's a real treat, so stay yeah. tuned. All right. All right. Thank we you, will guys. See you next time.